war in Ukraine is not going very well for Russia right now. Just looking at a map from late March compared to recently makes that pretty clear. They've lost ground pretty much everywhere except for Mariupol and a few areas in the east. In fact, Russia has been unable to conduct any large successful offenses since July. And not only that, but they are beginning to quickly lose more and more ground to Ukrainian counteroffenses. There really doesn't appear to be many options left for Russia at this point. Which brings up the topic of Russian nuclear weapons. Russia's nuclear doctrine allows for them to use nuclear weapons if the existence of their state is at threat, which is pretty vague and could be easily stated to be the case right now. It also includes a quote, direct threat to Russian territory, which after annexing parts of eastern Ukraine can again be claimed to be going on right now. So will they use them? But first, a quick thanks to this week's sponsor, HelloFresh. And honestly, I've still been using HelloFresh since the last time they were a sponsor back in April. But they send you foolproof, step-by-step -step recipes, along with all the ingredients you need right to your house, which is why I really like it. I don't like shopping, and I'm not a great cook either, so it's perfect for me. Plus, HelloFresh is up to 72% cheaper than eating at a restaurant, according to a Zagat dining survey. And then finally, the best part is all the options. There's something for everyone, even the pickiest eaters. And you can continue customizing and changing what's in your box as you go. Swap out or add proteins, vegetables, sides, and much more. So go over and check them out and see what they have for you. You'll save time shopping, save money eating out, and get to try new things and recipes. So use my link or go over to HelloFresh.com and use code P-O-G-C-O-V-E-R-T-65 for 65% off plus free shipping on your first box. Once you click, my description will live update to count up the purchases. So check them out. Again, HelloFresh. During the Cold War, it was actually the Soviet Union who came out very strongly with a no first use policy. That means they would not use nuclear weapons unless somebody else did it first, and that they had to use them in self-defense. The US, on the other hand, was the opposite. It wanted to reserve the right to use them whenever necessary. Now, this obviously made the Soviets look good and the US look bad on the international stage in their stance on nuclear war. But all that really came down to conventional power. The US and NATO were completely outnumbered in Europe. The Soviets in the Warsaw Pact had nearly three times more tanks, more than twice the number of artillery, three times more armored vehicles, and more than one and a half million more military personnel. So the only chance NATO had at stopping their feared Soviet invasion was to resort to using tactical nuclear weapons. Today, the opposite is true. The Warsaw Pact is gone, and many of the nations that made it up are now actually part of NATO. And Russia is completely outmatched conventionally. Today, Russia does not follow that same no first use policy of the Soviet Union, likely again as a way to compensate for their lack of conventional power. While the US still doesn't commit to a no first use policy, it regularly uses any talks of nuclear weapons by Russia as a chance to make them look bad on the international stage and a threat to global security. So all that to say, Russia could, right now, according to their doctrine, use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. If we want to know whether Russia is currently planning to use them, it's first worth taking a look at what their process is. The people in charge of Russia's nuclear arsenal is the 12th main directorate. It's part of the Ministry of Defense and likely the most secretive part of the MOD, which makes sense. Nuclear weapons are some of the most destructive and dangerous weapons ever created, so security is vital. It's really no different from the US policy to neither confirm nor deny the presence or absence of nuclear weapons at any general or specific location. So a lot of what we know about them comes from some guesswork. And there's certain people who spent a ton of time researching this topic for hints and pieces of the puzzle to form the bigger picture. One of those people is Pavel Podvig. Sorry if I pronounced that name wrong. Anyway, a lot of what we know comes from his work. The 12th main directorate has about a dozen central storage bases where nuclear weapons are stored. As you can see here, they're pretty distinctive. They have a large outer security perimeter with a double fence, then a security checkpoint to enter the base. From there, there are a few individual bunkers, and each of these have their own additional security fences around them. Inside here is where nuclear weapons are stored. It's believed that in the event of a crisis, where Russia believes that there is a chance it'll have to use nuclear weapons, the 12th main directorate would take these warheads from these central bases and bring them to base level storage sites. So for example, if it was nuclear warheads for cruise missiles that are launched from bombers, they would be brought to a storage site at the airbase that these bombers are stationed at. Moving these weapons is obviously another big security issue. It's believed that a convoy of trucks, along with a whole bunch of security and guards, would transfer them. We haven't seen much of these convoys, and there was a video that was making news recently claiming that it was one, but people with much more knowledge than me on this topic said that it necessarily wasn't that, so I'm going to default to them. But these base level storage sites that they are taken to look similar. They have additional security measures and underground storage with their own additional security perimeter. In this case here is Morozovsk Air Base that's equipped with Su-24s and Su-34 strike aircraft, which can carry out nuclear strike missions. 
Here, from the base level storage, those warheads would stay in possession of the 12th Main Directorate, likely up until the moment that they're loaded on the aircraft and ready for them to take off. And it's a similar case with nuclear warheads deployed for their naval forces, nuclear air defenses, and ballistic missile forces, both strategic and tactical. It's just here easier and more clear to show them with their air forces. So, with that information, will we even know if they're about to be used? Comparing satellite imagery is really not going to be very useful, as those warheads are stored underground, and any deviation in vehicle numbers could just be explained by normal operations. But this one here I figured would be the most interesting. It's a central storage base called Object 1150, and it's just 15 kilometers away from the border with Ukraine. Since it's so close, Google Earth doesn't have anything more recent than a year ago, so you won't see these images here without directly ordering them. 15 kilometers is real close, well within artillery range. But this first picture is from July, the second one is from October 12th. Again, unfortunately, there's not much we can make out. But going back, those nuclear convoys would give a hint, but again, it's hard to know for sure that it's actually transporting nuclear warheads. So any post you might see about them is worth taking note of, but take it with a large grain of salt. Next is what options they have to deliver these warheads to a target. In general, there are three. Gravity bombs dropped from aircraft, which is unlikely as they'd likely be shot down well before they could ever drop it. Cruise missiles that are both land and sea based. These would be things like the KH-102 or the Iskander-K. These could be used, but again, cruise missiles are slow and again run into the possibility of being shot down. The most likely option, in my opinion, is the Iskander-M ballistic missiles. Ballistic missiles are extremely difficult to shoot down, even for countries like the US and Russia with the most capable air and missile defense systems in the world. And Iskander-M has shown to be very reliable and accurate in combat. They have a range of roughly 500 kilometers. If we factor in a little bit less, as it wouldn't move these things right up to the front line to fire, if we look at a map, here is what they could hit. Also, this is not counting from Belarus. So it's pretty much everywhere except for far western Ukraine. Next is how powerful would these nuclear weapons even be? There's no strict defined definition for tactical or non-strategic nuclear weapons, but they are typically under 100 kilotons of TNT. A rough guess for an Iskander nuclear warhead might be between 25 and 50 kilotons. And don't make any mistake, that's pretty powerful. If we compare that to a conventional Iskander warhead, which is closer to one ton TNT equivalent, that'd be 25 to 50,000 times more powerful. But 50,000 times more powerful doesn't mean 50,000 times more destruction. A lot of that energy is just wasted going up into the atmosphere. It caused moderate damage over an area 175 times larger, so much less than the 50,000. Furthermore, again, a lot of that energy is wasted also because no military target is that large. Air bases are among some of the largest, and they tend to only be a few square kilometers, or four or five times smaller. And then any other type of military target is just further wasted energy, as they typically disperse. It's not like Ukrainian military units, tanks, etc. sit packed together. They spread out, they dig in, they're in shelters or armored vehicles, which would also further mitigate the value of these nuclear weapons. So realistically, these tactical nuclear weapons have minimal value. They're really only good at causing massive civilian casualties in use against populated areas. So if Russia wanted to use these against military targets, they're really not going to be a major boost. They would need to use many, many of them really just to make a difference. An interesting tweet here I found recently by Jan talked about a US 1977 plan which called for 136 tactical nuclear detonations to stop an advancing Soviet force. And that's just along a 100 kilometer front. The front in Ukraine is roughly 20 times that. Now that's an extreme example, but you can see just how many of these things they would need to use to make a difference. So, how many do Russia have? Russia probably has somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 tactical nuclear weapons, but we really don't know for sure. There's been accusations by US government officials in the past that Russia has been building more of these recently. Now, 2,000 sounds like a lot, but that includes all types. Naval-based, air defenses, air-launched, and our ballistic missiles like Iskander that we're focusing on. Nearly half of those tactical warheads are for their navy, with things like caliber, anti-submarine rockets, torpedoes, depth charges, etc. Several hundred more in their air defense, hundreds with aircraft, which leaves us likely around 100 for their ballistic missiles. And again, I just want to make it clear that these are just tactical weapons, not the strategic ones used on those large ICBMs. So 100, and maybe a few hundred more if you want to include the cruise missile variants. And that brings up another question. Do Russian warheads even work? We've seen a lot of Russian weaponry fail to live up to the reputation during the war. Honestly, there's no way of knowing. Russia has never tested a nuclear weapon. The last tests they did were carried out during Soviet times. Also, the US hasn't tested one in just over 30 years now. And testing and verifying that these warheads still do work, without being able to test them directly, has been a major project in the US. Different subcomponents are tested individually, and then they can assume that if they each work, that they'd also work all together at the same time. 
but even if you assume that Russian warheads are half as effective, that's still enough. Also, radiation is another factor. Now this is a really complicated subject, but suffice it to say, for the most part, the smaller nuclear warhead used, the smaller amount of radiation threat. Now there are exceptions, but that generally is the case. Also, nuclear weapons tend to be detonated in the air, and not on the ground. Really the only time you would use them on the ground is if you're going after an underground or a really hardened bunker. An airburst warhead really maximizes the blast radius, while at the same time not kicking up as much dust up into the atmosphere that becomes irradiated, causing fallout. Now that doesn't mean there would be no radiation problems, but it wouldn't be the feared nuclear winter or the apocalypse that's commonly discussed when talking about nuclear war. Then there's many other more issues that could also be covered, such as EMPs, the effects of their use on international trade and the stock market, but most importantly might be what the US and the West might do if Russia did use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. This is also unknown. There's been a few officials and former military generals who have stated that they would respond kinetically. General Petraeus, for example, discussed the US going in and striking Russian units in Crimea and sinking their entire Black Sea fleet. But one thing that's been abundantly clear is that the West has been trying to support Ukraine as much as possible without going so far as risking escalation with Russia and turning it into World War III. For example, not sending in its own troops, not setting up a no-fly zone, limiting the weapon types they're sending, such as attackums, and more. It's almost certain that Western countries right now are communicating through back channels with Russia what their response would be if they did use nuclear weapons. So if I had to guess, it wouldn't involve any type of kinetic attack, but so to say take the gloves off and start sending in longer range and more powerful weapons to Ukraine. That way it's not risking a larger war, but they're letting Putin know ahead of time that if he does decide to use them, then he has to accept that he knew that these weapons would then be sent to Ukraine, and hopefully therefore not further escalate. So, with all that said, what are the odds of Russia actually using nuclear weapons? Again, honestly, it's impossible to answer that question, but I'd still say it's pretty low. If you really had to put a number on it, maybe 10 to 20%. The very fact that they have not yet means that they know it's at very most a measure of last resort. Instead, they're trying every other option, from mobilizing their population to recently striking civilian infrastructure such as power plants. But in the end, it's unlikely either of these will change the course of the war. Striking infrastructure is more of the old strategic bombing, something kind of related to what is called terror bombing that's virtually always failed. The objective is to break the will of civilians to continue resisting, and we've seen this in pro-Russian telegram posts such as Rybars. But again, throughout history, it's not only just failed, but often it's had the reverse effect. It further united the British during World War II, the Vietnamese during the Vietnam War, and countless more to fight back against the enemy that they now see as without any mercy, which leaves them no other choice. So, in conclusion, Russia could use nuclear weapons. There's nothing in their doctrine or law preventing them. The odds are probably low that they will though, but even if they did, it's unlikely to have a major impact. There would absolutely be a ripple effects across Ukraine and internationally on the global markets, etc. But in the long run, it's not the end of the world. To some extent, their impact is much more psychological than physical, so it kind of comes down to how people decide to react. Again, I don't mean to make it sound like I'm minimizing the devastation and loss of life that would result, and then also the fear of the war escalating into a world war. And then finally, I want to give a shout out to Project Owl on Discord. It's a real cool social media channel gathering people that are interested in this type of stuff, and they talk about it all before it becomes actual news. You'll find a lot of real knowledgeable people there that you could talk to directly. We recently had a live talk about most of the things I've talked about here. Unfortunately though, due to technical issues, it might be lost. But they have more stuff lined up, including Ivan Stepanov. If you don't know about him, be sure to look him up. He created that nuclear war simulator. Anyway, thanks so much for watching.